All right. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at your workshop. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the work we have done recently in uh, Austria and Facebook um, on uh, learning representations as well as geometry to the N3D from uh, label videos and images as well. So that's the menu uh, topic for today. I'm going to go through a set of works that cover um, learning different aspects of vision from a low level representations to the shape by increasing essentially the level of abstraction of uh, um, what you get from, from your algorithm. Okay, so we're going to start from the first topic, which is learning representations. So what I mean by learning representation here. So representation is uh, just a function that you apply to uh, say an image or a video and that function maps that image or video to some high dimensional vector. And this function usually is implemented as a, a DPR network so you can learn it uh, from data. And then of course the goal of the representation is to provide you a vector or a representation of the data that is useful to solve a task of interest. Uh, this task could be for example classifying the image by mapping um, uh, that vector onto uh, a discrete label, in this case called Finch. Okay? Now, when you have uh, supervision, so you have, for example, a data set of images with labels, you can use this as a supervisory signal to train the weights of the network. But when you don't have that, what can you do? Well, usually, uh, we, at least in this day and age, what we do is to design a pretext task that's a problem which is not only the one you want to solve, but for which you can generate data very cheaply and is still good enough to train or pre-initialize the weight of this network, this representation. Now, when you are working with, with videos in particular, uh, there is a very, uh, a very significant richness or variety of pretext uh, you can use. The reason is that in addition to having images, you also have time. And for example, here, uh, the, test, the task is to reorder the frame in a video in the correct temporal order, and you can use this as pretext to learn a network. Or you can use multiple modalities. So you have uh, visual components, you have uh, a sound component, and there is some correlation between the two, and you can try to learn a representation to pick out this correlation. And the correlation is related to the presence of certain abstract objects in the image, so this is usually a very good supervisory signal, okay? And if you look at the literature, there is a huge variety of different methods that have been proposed that uh, use these ideas and others. And, uh, you know, the literature is just very rich and progress is being made. But the question here is, uh, can we somehow unify and get a sort of a comprehensive overview of these different signals that have been proposed in the literature and maybe uh, you know, so use them in the same framework so we can combine them and compare them in a sort of a seamless manner. So this is what, we, uh, we're, uh, what we're going to do uh, next. And uh, I'm going to start from a simple observation. Uh, so if I want to learn a representation, one way of doing that is to learn the representation to be invariant to certain transformation of the input image, right? So this is a cat. And if I apply transformation like cropping the image or uh, rotating the image, that does not change the meaning of the image. That's still a cat, OK? Now, this means that the representation of the image, which should be presumably a proxy to the task you want to solve, let's say image classification, should also not change. That means the representation is invariant to the effect of these transformations. Okay? Now, this is the basis for uh, a lot of the methods that are now popular that use contrastive learning. What this means is that you learn a function phi, which is your representation, that maps your images to vectors in such a way that if you apply a transformation to the input image or video, that does not affect the vector that is being computed. Uh, or at least it changes very little. However, if you sample a different video or a different image, then you would expect, on average, on in fact, in the vast majority of cases, your representation should change quite a bit because, generally speaking, the content of that new image or video would be different from the content of the, of the first image you have considered. So by using, by, uh, using these sort of constraints, then uh, it turns out you can learn very successfully representation for images. Okay? Now, in order to implement that, uh, what really works well at the moment, at least, is to use a noise contrastive formulation. What it means is you're going to take, you're going to start from a selection of images like that. You're going to apply some transformations to them. That's a batch of images with transformed versions of them. You're going to put those also as a rows of a matrix. You're going to create a matrix like, like this. Now, what this means is that whenever there is a one in that matrix, it means that you want those two images to be treated identically in a sort of equivalent manner by your representation. When there is a zero, you want instead the representation to diverge, to, to be different. And the dots are used to denote cases that you sort of ignore. In this case, 
Uh, they correspond to comparing an image with itself, which, which would be a little bit too easy and therefore not informative for learning a network algorithm. Okay? So that's the basis for noise contrastive learning. That's the batch of images with transformations and decisions about what goes together and what is being instead pushed apart. Once you have that, you can uh, write an objective function that scores uh, the model you have, uh, phi, and then you can minimize that between your network. Um, the specific version uh, that I'm going to use here is this noise contrastive loss, um, which is a similar to uh, yeah, softmax loss. Sorry. <coughs> Um, well, yeah, a softmax loss using, uh, um, uh, however, this decision about images going together or not in order to learn to pull up close together or push apart the corresponding representations according to this matrix. All right. So now the question is, can I take this and uh, systematically generalize it so I can express with it all sorts of kind of different pretext tasks beyond the one that are typically considered in noise contrastive learning and also give me a principal way of combining them so I can get richer set of formulations to work with and they can explore them systematically. So to do that, we have introduced this idea of generalized transformation, data transformation. What does that do? Well, it's actually very simple. So the fundamental, the, the, the fundamental step here is to regard all possible effects that you want to consider in your formulation as some sort of transformation. So for example, when you want to build my batch, one thing I need to do is to sample data, okay? That's typically not considered transformation, but you can write it as a transformation if the input to the transformation itself is not a single image, but is the entire data set. So the first thing we do is we allow transformations to operate at the level of a data set as opposed to the level of the single images. All right, so that's how we encode data samples as a transformation. And then uh, when we work with videos, very often we, work, we, work, we want to reason uh, about the individual modalities, visual and, and, and sound separately. And we can do that by introducing slicing transformation, which extracts these two components from, uh, from the video. Okay? So then we can get a uh, contrastive formulation uh, that is applied to video and uses a slightly unusual transformation for contrastive learning or noise contrastive learning. But of course, this captures things that other authors have tried before, which is uh, in a slightly different way. So we can use them in a sort of unified manner. So data sampling again is a transformation, which is a little unusual in the sense of being called a transformation. Modality slicing, and then we also consider time reversal, flipping the time axis in the video, and time shift, so shifting the, uh, the video a little bit in time. Okay? Now we want to learn a representation that can be, for example, distinctive for data sampling. It means you sample the different videos, you expect your representation to change. It can be invariant, sorry, distinctive to modal, sorry, invariant to modality slicing. It means that you want to obtain the same representation regardless of the fact that uh, you look at uh, the visual component or the sound component. And for time reversal and time shift, well, we are not really sure. So we don't know a priori, uh, in the sense that it's not obvious from the literature, which one of the two we should pick. So we can allow, we can use this framework to actually test two hypotheses and pick out the best one. So then this basically is the basics uh, of, our, our, of this framework. And this also allows you to combine the transformations together. So for example, here I can start from a data transformation. The first thing I'm going, to do, I'm going to do is to sample a video seen as a transformation itself. Then out of these samples, I'm going to apply two different time shifts. And out of these two time shifts, I'm going to extract two modalities. And then eventually I'm going to apply a fourth transformation, which is uh, just incorporating a standard uh, augmentation like rotational problem, all right? And this describes how I construct the batch that goes into contrastive learning. Okay, this is a hierarchical sampling scheme that tells me how I'm going to take the transformation that go in contrastive learning in, in the noise contrastive formulation. And then, comparing to this, there is a table that tells me which one of these phase of transformation I consider to be equivalent and therefore lead to an invariance that is being learned. And this is a one little table, or a zero means that I'm gonna, I want to uh, learn to be distinctive for that effect. And dots means I'm going to ignore uh, those pairs instead. So for details, uh, please look at the paper. But this gives you, gives you the high level of this. And also, uh, there is a little bit of theory that tells you when and how you can combine transformation in a way that actually makes sense. So with this, we can now do some experiments. And so here, what I'm going to do is uh, train the uh, presentation using, I think, Kinetic 500, 400. Uh, using uh, this framework, and then I'm going to transfer the pre trained transformation on a, on a data set which is called HMDB51, and I'm going to measure performance. And I'm going to contrast here three things doing nothing, or that is to say, using a standard formulation, 
or also incorporating invariance to time shift or distinctiveness to time shift. And you can see here that the best in this case is to be distinctive to time shift, all right? In addition to all the other invariances and uh, distinctivenesses that you would typically use in a, in a formulation like this. So this is on top of that. Uh, time reversal is similar, but in this case, both invariant, the invariant time, time reversal or distinctive to that improve the final performance, okay? And of course, you can play with combination of these things. And uh, as you would expect, well, as you would hope at least, uh, combinations actually perform better than uh, the individual effects. And this is allowed by the framework because it allows this combination of uh, different training singles into a single representation. And when you compare this to other uh, methods that have been proposed in the literature uh, to learn from videos, these representations, it turns out that at the moment, at least, this method is state of the art in HMDB 51. UCF 101, and we have uh, uh, many, many experiments in the paper, which is on archive now. So if you're interested, I, I just invite you to have a look at that. Of course, maybe next week someone else is going to beat us, but at the moment, that's, that's the state of the, state, the situation. OK? All right, this is about learning representations. The next step is going to be about learning labels. Um, so this is already one level of a structure now. And by this, what I mean is I'm not just interested in getting a vector that describes my video. But I actually want to get a discrete label for that uh, video, which is essentially a class or a name. And I want to get these labels in a way which would be as similar as possible to how a human would actually label that data. So I want to get my method to extract from the videos, the video collection, automatically something which is a proxy to semantics. Okay? So if you are faced with this problem of learning a uh, clustering of the data, and you also want to learn a representation together with it, so you, your clustering performs better, what you want to do is simultaneous, simultaneous clustering and representational learning. Okay? Now the, when, the obvious way of doing that is to take a deep neural network, add some clustering objective on top of that, for example, k-means, that gives you an energy function that you can optimize to find out the clusters. But then you can also optimize the same energy with respect to the deep neural network. So you can optimize them jointly, and hopefully that's going to work. If you try that, at least in principle, this actually doesn't work. And the reason is that a trigger solution for this is to map all of your points to the same cluster. And now, because you're allowed to tweak the representation of your uh, videos or images, you can also make all of these vectors to collapse on the cluster mean. Okay? And this obviously will minimize your k means energy function. So what can you do in order to fix this problem? So in Ikea this year, we have introduced this method, which we call CELA, which stands for set labeling, which combines two ideas um, on top of basic clustering. One is to get the cluster to be transformation invariant. It means you want a transformation applied to an image not to change the cluster the image is not to. And that makes sense to just capture prior knowledge about the invariances that your representation should have, just like we have seen in contrastive learning. And by the way, this has been used in clustering many times before. So this is not new, but it's useful, all right? What we did more, uh, in addition to that, was to fix the degeneracy that you would get by optimizing something like the k objective by forcing the clusters to have equal mass, all right? Now, this is a very strong assumption, but at the time, we were interested in learning a representation, so we didn't really care all that much about the semantics of the clusters, and it was, this was fine. Now, if you look at how the representation, the, the algorithm actually works, um, it's relatively elegant. You, know, you get a single objective function, if you, when you train your representation against this objective, you optimize phi. What you do is essentially standard learning on the neural network with respect to a classification objective. So that's very standard and works very well. And when you want to optimize your labels, uh, you're not still minimizing the same energy. And the problem you're solving is a large scale transport problem, and for which there is a you know, very efficient algorithm that you can uh, use. So this is, you know, works well. Um, and uh, I invite you to look at the paper for the details. So what is the result of this? Well, the result of this is that now we have a method for self-supervised learning of clustering image collections. And lately, we have extended that to videos. So what you get is Celavi, which is a clever pun, I guess. At least the student was very happy about it. I'm not, I don't know about myself, but anyway, so there you have it. So what are the changes that we have applied on top of uh, um, our regional labeling method? Well, the first one was to allow the classes not to be uniform, and that's reflect the fact that most labels in nature, uh, they are not distributed uniformly, but they use, usually fall apart. So we allow the method now to use that. But the second thing, which is actually more, much more important in terms of performance, is that we force the clusters to be invariant to choosing either the audio or visual modality. So similar to what they have done for um, 
uh, you know, learning representations, but now it's applied to clustering, and we want the clusters to be obtained in the same manner, regardless of whether you're looking at the video or, or, the, or the visual component or the sound component. Okay. We tested this on VGC Sound plus more, more data sets in the paper. Uh, VGC Sound is a new data set, which is similar to audio set, for instance. It's, uh, however, smaller, but uh, has cleaner clusters. So this is a data set which has been collected uh, by, by partially by hand or anyway, but it's rather clean, uh, which allows us to test how well the labels that we obtain by running our unsupervised method for clustering actually match human, in, human provided labels. And we do that by measuring normalized mutual information. Okay, so let's see how this works. So this is the performance of this method when we run it on BGG sound. Uh, NMI here, you know, with 52.6%, 53.2, which is the best we got, is actually rather high. It means that there's a very good correlation between human provided labels and the ones that are, that are, that are automatically discovered. But you see that the biggest jump here comes from going from learning only by clustering images, as opposed to cluster images and sounds together in this sort of joint manner. This really gives you a boost of 30 points, which is really huge. It really, I mean, this, you were not the first to show the importance of this, but this is another the confirmation of the fact that the, by looking at the correlation between the visual and sound modality, you can get a lot of information, especially about abstract object classes. Okay, that's just the nature of the correlation that you're using to look for learning. Now, if you also allow the method to learn a non-uniform distribution over classes, that boosts your performance a little bit, um, not very much. I guess one reason for that is that which is sound tends to be relatively uniform in terms of labels, but not quite. So you still have a little bit of a help there. The other thing we, we did is was to compare this to the obvious alternative approach, which is to pre-train your presentation also in an unsupervised manner, freeze it, and then run some clustering on top and see whether it was actually better to do this sort of simultaneously clustering and representation learning. And the result of the slide is that yes, it is actually better, at least in the experiments that we could run so far. Uh, even if you train your representation using, say, how, how to 100 million, you freeze it and then you cluster on which is sound, you don't get as good as a performance if you were to train and uh, also cluster on the VGG sounds directly using our formulation. Although VGG sound only contains hundreds of thousands of videos and also 100 million. So it's a huge difference in amount of training data. All right. So that's, that's what I wanted to say about learning labels. Next step is going to be learning pose. So one level up in the hierarchy of abstractions. And what I want to do now is to describe the content of images in a sort of, sort of geometric manner. In particular, I'm looking for the pose of people. So here I have an image of a guy running. And I want to, do, to learn in an unsupervised manner a network that can map that to a description of the geometry um, of, of the pose of the person. And the way I'm going to do that is to pose that as an auto encoding problem. It means that given the geometry, I'm going to learn a paired decoder network that takes that and reproduces the input image. Okay? If you think about this, um, um, uh, I mean, this can, uh, can work, but you need to do something in order to shape the code that you're getting in such a way that you can say it is actually encoding for geometry. All right? So otherwise, it would just be some vector representation that computes, but you know, there is no reason why would, that would be interpretable as geometry. So how can you make the code geometrically interpretable? So one way, which is, uh, has been uh, tried by many authors, uh, us, including uh, other people um, uh, before us and you know, uh, along with us, is to just make sure that the encoder produces a set of two-dimensional key points. Okay, so we design the encoder network to be effectively a key point detector for that image. Then we extract some key points which we hope are going to somehow match the human, but we don't know because this is unsupervised. And then we do the decoding to the constructed image and get our supervisory signal, right? Now, we do not necessarily expect these key points to be semantic and interpretable to a human. They will land somewhere somewhere on the body, but they might not be as nice as the ones they showed here in the slide as a, as a sort of tutorial representation or icon. For example, you don't necessarily get key points that correspond to the joint of the human body, but in general, you're going to get key points that are attached to the human body somehow, right? Now, this is fine, but this is still not enough. And the reason is that if you want to reconstruct the uh, image from this geometry, uh, the representational ge geometry, you really can't because while you don't know about the appearance of the scene, you only know about the shape of it, right? 
So how can you solve this issue? Well, the trick here is that you're going to use a video to train the system, and you're going to pick the geometry from one frame, and then you're going to pick the appearance from a different frame. All right, and then you're going to combine these two informations in reconstructing the final image. Now, why does this make sense? Well, the reason is that at least uh, if, you, if you observe a video for a short uh, time span, usually the geometry changes because the, the pose of the person is actually variable, but the appearance is rather stable because you know, the person is not changing clothes while running or the background is not going to change all that dramatically. So by using the fact that uh, geometry varies more uh, but faster than appearance, then we can use this as a way of encouraging the expression of these two factors when we train the model. Okay. Now, we're going to add one more ingredient. So we're going to represent our geometry not just as a, a bunch of two-dimensional points, but we're going to change the method. And this is something we did this year. Um, in order to be a stick figure. So uh, instead of predicting two-dimensional points, what we do now is we predict an actual image of a you know, sort of schematic representation of the person. All right. Now, why do we do that? This seems very strange, but there are two advantages in doing that. First, the stick figure we get is constrained by the discriminator to look like a plausible skeleton, all right? so a plausible stick figure that might correspond to an actual person. And what this means is that when we train the system, we get a pose representation which is directly human interpretable. The key points we're getting now, they actually are something that it resembles the sort of key points that a human would get for that particular image. They're not just some arbitrary key points, but rather the joints of the human body. So that's, that's the first advantage we get here. The second advantage is that we can use for the mapping image to image translation networks, like the ones that use, it, use for example, a cyclegram. And these are actually turn out to be very powerful. So it's more easy to translate between, from two images, from one image to another, as opposed to translating one image into a set of two-dimensional coordinates for key points. Now, the encoder and the decoder there are this image to image translation network, and they can take advantage of this uh, property of these networks to be very uh, robust. The final, uh, but this is still not quite enough. So what's the problem here? The problem is that the code that we get, the bottleneck that should represent geometry, um, actually might leak information about appearance because it's high dimensional, it's a whole image. It is very easy for the network to sneak some appearance information into the way we represent geometry. And we would like to keep geometry and appearance very well separated in our system because that usually leads to better performance. So how do we do that here? Well, the idea is relatively simple. What we do is we extract our stick figure, that's an image uh, there on the left, and then we run a key point detector on top of that. And this is something that we train in a completely synthetic manner, so it does not require any training data to do that. We extract the two-dimensional points. These are actually interpretable joints of the human body. And then we re-render the stick figure by just basically linking the points with lines in a sort of way which is differentiable. And that is a version of the original skeleton image for which any sort of uh, leakage information, uh, from which any sort of leakage information has been removed, because that's now obtained by just linking two dimensional points together. Okay? It's much harder for the network to leak appearance information in pose at this point with this bottleneck. In addition to that, we also get the location of the two dimensional points, which is effectively what you want to get at the end of the day. So we will need to do the detector anyway at some point. In addition to that, we have our scanner discriminator and the appearance encoder as before using the, the other video frame. So this is a, the system applied to a data set of faces. So what you see here is the skeleton is represented not as lines, but just a collection of two-dimensional facial landmarks. And this was trained by showing to the, to, to the network videos, but not a single, single one of these videos was trained with corresponding facial landmarks. Okay? So it means this is a case in which we have some prior information of what a reasonable face landmark configuration looks like, but we don't have any, any uh, data point labeled with the any uh, image or video labeled with corresponding landmarks to train from. So it's a case of unsupervised, uh, sorry, unpaired learning, if you like. And uh, nevertheless, you can see that in a surprise manner, the method is able to very well align our landmarks to, to video faces. Now, once you have done that, uh, you have a generator, which is a, you know, a function of the to be
Okay, we okay, it looks like we lost Andrea. Um, I hope we will come back soon. Okay, it looks like uh, Andrea had some connectivity issue. Um, he will join soon. Um, just point to remind uh, people in the audience that um, you can ask questions at any time during the talk. Just enter the question in the chat window. And yeah, uh, sorry. It's all right, we have you again. <laughs> I lost connection, didn't arise for a bit. So I don't know why you lost my, in my presentation. Um, if you can share your screen again. Yeah. Sorry about that. Just the connection okay. dropped. Okay, let me try again. Uh, yep. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I don't know where you where you where I lost you. Uh, we we saw these slides. Okay. All right. Cool. Then the woman with the landmark. I think we saw okay. that. Oh, okay. But right before that. Yeah, so here is good. Great, excellent. All right, um, so you didn't lose much yet. Um, so what I was saying is that this works also for um, full human bodies. It's just a harder task, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's quite successful if you're here too. Not, comp not comparable in terms of quality to something you can supervise if you had you know, held labels, manually rotated, but pretty good. Whereas for faces, actually, the performance of this unsupervised method is actually not quite competitive. To the point that you can even start to replace manual labels just with that. Okay. All right. So uh, the next thing I wanted to discuss a bit was um, three-dimensional estimation of human body pose. For that, I'm going to use some prior information in the form of uh, uh, a three-body model. I'm going to use simple. And so what that does, it takes a vector of pose parameters and a vector of shape parameters, theta and beta map that to a 3D mesh, which is pose. So it gets it has a particular pose as well as shape. And I also have some uh, 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 prior on the poses, uh, pose parameters themselves, which usually take the form of a Gaussian or a mixture of Gaussian. Now, if I give an image like that, and then my task is to estimate the pose, how can I do this? Well, one way would be to detect two dimensional key points. Then you can extract the same key points for a dimensional mesh. You can project them down to the image. You can compare these two things with a loss. And then you can back propagate all right, onto your pose and shape parameters. And you can optimize them until you, until you get a good match. And that will reconstruct your two-dimensional pose. Okay? This is done, for example, by Simplify. Now, more recently, people have tried to do something different, which does not require to have this uh, loop, which involves a optimization problem, which can get stuck in local optima. So what you can do in that instead is just to train a deep network file which takes an image and directly spits out the parameters of uh, a pose and shape for it to be modeled. CMR and spinner for examples of that. Now this works well, it's very robust, but um, generally speaking, the two-dimensional alignment of your landmarks might not be as good as you can get with Simplify. So what we do here is to treat um, this sort of model that do this sort of, um, uh, you know, direct estimate of uh, the shape of conditional prior for the shape itself. So the, the network has some parameter W, okay? And what we're gonna do is gonna first use the network to get an initial estimate. Then we're gonna extract our two-dimensional landmarks from that, do the same from the uh, SNPL model, and just do the same sort of loss and optimization as uh, Simplify does by trying to match the 2D landmarks that we measure to the ones we predicted. And now instead of tweaking the pose and the shape directly, what we do is we tweak the parameters of the network, which estimates those conditionally on the input image, okay? Now we do this because this network, which is pre-trained to do post recognition, 
actually acquires lots of prior information about dimensional body shapes, and this might lead to better performance, and it does in practice. So you see here this running on, uh, on uh, an example where this initial output is obtained, I think, by spin, and then we optimize it to better match the dimensional learner except test time. And here you see it compared to simplifying instead. Now, this is similar to train the network, but it's not training the network for the purpose of uh, getting a better regressor. It's actually optimizing the network on an instance by instance basis, basis at test time to get a better 3D reconstruction. All right? So this is actually very different in the motivation. And this is especially good when you have uh, um, partial information. So if you only see, for example, half of the human body, if you do not have a very strong prior of what the other half is doing, you get crazy results. So that's what you see here on the top. But if you do use this trick of optimizing this network at test time for each frame in this video in this case, then you get results which make, make a lot more sense. Now, you can do even better by imposing some sort of temporal continuity in the video, which we're not doing here, so that's why things flicker still. But generally speaking, this method really shows that this network, these pre-trained models, they do contain a very strong prior on plausible human body poses. And if you're interested in this problem of the reconstruction from biggest data, we have another paper that's come up, going to come up soon in archive, where it's, we explore the problem of predicting multiple hypotheses from the spatial evidence. So it doesn't just give you a sensible reconstruction, but a space of possible reconstructions, which sort of makes sense given your input data. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to move to the last step, uh, last uh, um, section of, of the talk, which is learning 3D shape. So we've done the presentation label, uh, 2D and 2D pose, now 3D shape. So uh, when we do 3D pose for humans, so 3D shape for humans, usually we start from a model like SMPL that requires a significant amount of supervision to train. And that, that usually involves using a specialized hardware like a dome. But of course, this does not generalize. If you go around the world, you want to reconstruct everything. That is what we want to do effectively. For example, it wouldn't work for an elephant. You cannot put that in that machine. And in general, you want to be able to scale up to hundreds of thousands of different object kinds or categories. So how can we do that? Well, we require systems which are less supervised. Particularly, I'm going to consider non rigid structure for motion. So the goal here is given uh, two-dimensional points uh, labeled on the image, either automatically or manually, we want to lift them up to a third dimension. And we want to do that not for a single object multiple views, but rather for an object category or for a set of deformable objects, if you like. All right. Now, in the last year, we have introduced in ICCD a method which is called C3DPO, which does this by using a deep neural network and is actually very effective. So that at the time it was still the art for energy structure for motion and it's still a very, very strong method for doing this, all right? So, uh, but this is not quite enough because that is okay, but it requires as input to dimensional points and you reconstruct only uh, a sparse set of 3D points uh, as output. So it works a little bit like this. So you take an input image, you apply a detector, and then you have your network, which is going to spit out two things, the viewpoint of the camera, RMT, and the set of coefficients alpha 1 to alpha d, which represents the shape deformation you have. Okay? Now, uh, this is fine because it's captured geometry. It can also capture correspondence between different objects because these landmarks, they have a sort of universal validity. What is an eye in one bird is going to be also an eye in another bird. So you capture correspondence between shapes, which means is somehow reason about them globally as opposed to treat each one of them individually as a different object. It's also canonical in the sense that the reconstruction is viewpoint free because you're just making the viewpoint of the camera too. However, it is sparse and again, it requires two dimensional points as input as opposed to an image. Alternatively, you could use a different representation uh, to represent three geometry. It could be, for example, a depth map. Now, this associates each pixel, the distance of a pixel from the observer, and that is dense and it captures geometry, obviously, to the shape. But it doesn't have any notion whatsoever of correspondences. So each reconstruction is independent in a way. And it's not canonical because it depends on the specific observation points of that particular image. And the third representation you might want to consider are canonical maps. These are also, uh, sorry, that's a typo. It should be non-parametric. They capture densely correspondences between different objects. So what this does is to take an image of an object and map each pixel of that object onto a canonical space, which is denoted here uh, with a sphere, in such a way that if you now take another image of the same object and you find the corresponding point, that would be y and y prime in this, in this image, 
then they are both mapped to the same canonical coordinates in this canonical space, all right? So this is a way of expressing correspondences between different object instances, or even within the same object after the formations or a change of viewpoint. Now what we did here is to come up with a combination of these ideas, or if you like, a new representation, which is similar to a canonical map in the sense that it starts from an input image and gives you canonical coordinates. But then what it does is use these canonical coordinates to index, okay, a set of uh, basis functions that are also being represented by a deep neural network in such a way that when you combine them, you reconstruct the shape of your object. So this is in a way similar to knowledge structure for motion with the difference that you have an infinite set of possible key points. And these key points are estimated densely from the input image using canonical map, okay? Now, this, you can see here some example of reconstruction we get from this. The supervision for this is still sparse, just to, the, to these sparse key points. And at test time, we don't even need those. We can just plug an image, and then that will speed out at, at this reconstruction like that. You see that applied to two birds, to four birds, sorry. You also note that the birds are colored. That's because we're also learning a texture model in addition to the shape model. You see this also for cars. And you will notice that differently from that map, we get a reconstruction for all the sides of the car simultaneously. That's because uh, we are learning the sort of the deformable shape basis, which is universal, uh, or that is to say is valid uh, in a canonical space for possible viewpoints. So we get a complete reconstruction, not just as a partial one as you would get with a depth map. And finally, because we have a, um, a texture model, you can also learn about uh, um, yeah, how texture behave. And you can use this, for example, for the enactments or texture transfer. It means you can take the texture parameter that you get from one bird, apply them to another bird, so you're going to get a version of that bird colored with the colors of the, of the first one. All right, this just shows that the texture is learned in a sort of a um, geometrically meaningful manner too. All right, so uh, I'm a bit lost because of the break with the time. So how much time do I have left, please? About uh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. And then I'm going to go very quickly to the last, uh, very last paper I want to present today. Uh, that's uh, also actually asking ourselves, okay, so, so far I've seen that we can do 3D reconstruction, provided that I have at least uh, this revision level of two-dimensional key points, but can we do more? So can we go, can we do 3D reconstruction without uh, using any sort of uh, a prior model like SMTL for shape? Can we not use any multiple views? Can we avoid using depth maps? Can we avoid using silhouettes, key points, 2D key points or 3D ones? Can we not know about the camera viewpoints? Essentially, can we avoid knowing anything at all about images except the images themselves and still be able to do 3D reconstruction? Now, what we found out is that actually going the extra mile or removing all supervisions completely is actually very, very challenging, okay? So as long as you know something, just maybe just the camera viewpoint or silhouette, that's already a very strong hint of what to do. But if you don't know absolutely anything, this is actually where really, this is sort of a jump in the, in the difficulty, I think. Or this is what we found. So this is, the, uh, this is a paper uh, which is the CNCPR that actually tries to, to do this to reconstruction, starting only from a set of independent images extracted from the internet and cropped around the object, in this case, a cat face. And the output of that is a network that's given a single image at a time, can produce as output a pretty convincing to the reconstruction of it, okay? So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we're gonna use one assumption. We're gonna assume that the objects are roughly symmetric which is, you know, fairly, uh, it's actually true for a lot of the objects you might want to reconstruct. Animals, they tend to have bilateral symmetry, most of them that do, but this is true uh, for many, many objects you can find in nature, you know, or you know, man-made man -made objects as well. So it's not a very strong assumption, but it's a very useful one. So we formulate this as uh, what we call photometric autoencoding, which is a uh, sort of a big word just to say that we have an autoencoding pipeline in which the code vectors or the code, the representation, that is computed by the network has a photogeometric interpretation. So in this case, it means we have a network that estimates viewpoints, another one that estimates depth, and a third one that estimates texture, okay? And then we plug this into a differentiable renderer, we train everything to minimize the reconstruction loss, and we hope for the best. And if you hope for the best, you try this out, it doesn't work, all right? So what you get is immediately a degenerate solution in which depth is flat, and the, depth, the image is just copied as text or uh, whole, all right? So this doesn't learn anything useful. So the, here is where symmetry enters in the picture. So what we do is we encourage the, the construction of the texture and the depth to be symmetric, okay, by the medial axis here on the image. 
And if you do that, the reconstruction turns out not to be the degenerate anymore. So again, this is the degenerate solution, not no symmetry. And this is the non-degenerate solution that we do once we enforce symmetry on top. Okay. Now, how do we enforce symmetry here? We could have done that by adding another term to our uh, reconstruction loss, but we rather prefer not to do that because that involves having another parameter to tune. What we do instead is we randomly flip the depth and the texture reconstruction that the metal obtains uh, with 50% probability. And then we do the reconstruction again. All right. So we either we have this switch that chooses either uh, one version of the reconstruction or the flipped version, and we want in both cases to still get the correct reconstruction as output. And you can see that this encourages the reconstructions to be symmetric, because in this case, obviously, if I flip them, nothing changes, and the reconstruction is correct in both cases, right? This however, is not, still not quite enough, because although the texture may appear to be symmetric, actually, usually it isn't. And the reason is that there is a strong directional light uh, that we miss most objects in spaces in particular. And so in order to fix this problem, what we needed to do was to also model lighting. Which means that now we have a, a normal that comes from looking at the depth, which is being reconstructed. We also are predicting light direction. And now, what was textured before really becomes albedo. So, given the uh, 3D depth, uh, the lighting, and the shading, and the albedo, we can get a reconstruction of the face in the canonical view, and then we can warp it to get our uh, reconstruction of the face depth, okay? minimizing the reconstruction loss. And the last thing we do, and that's the last technical point I want to make, is even if you do that, so this solves the problem that the lighting is not symmetric, you still gonna see that there are some parts of the object, like the hair in this, uh, this person, that are not symmetric just because they are not. Um, and so what can you do about that? Well, we relax our model to only deal with objects which are prob probably symmetric, but not necessarily symmetric. And we do this by introducing confidence maps. We do that one for the straight reconstruction, one for the symmetric reconstruction, where you can see that the confidence here in the region of the hair is actually lower uh, right there. And the reason is that the model, the network learns that if the image is not symmetric, then those parts of the image will not be reconstructed very well when you try to enforce symmetry of the reconstruction. And this is actually also done implicitly in the loss by using a probabilistic formulation that allows this confidence to self calibrate without the need to introduce any additional weighting factors or anything to the loss. Okay, so that's the whole framework. And these are some results. So on the, you see here applied to human faces. One nice thing about the 3D reconstruction you get here is that you can sort of recognize the identity of the person from the geometric details, which is surprising given that, I mean, if you were to specialize, if you were to use a method specialized for face reconstruction that uses maybe some prior to the model for that, then I'm sure you can get better results than these. But given that we do not have, not have any supervision or any prior knowledge about faces before we run this on, internet images which are not given multiple views, I think this is a uh, pretty solid result. Now, the model was trained to generalize actually pretty well. We can apply that to faces of paintings, and you can see that the reconstruction was fairly, fairly reasonable. But of, of course, these paintings are fairly realistic, so it's not all that surprising. But even if you push uh, the needle a bit and you put in uh, you know, more abstract paintings, you still get out some sort of reconstructions which make a lot of sense. You can see that, for example, in the emoji in the bottom right, which is reconstructed in which which uh, makes geometric sense, although it's a little bit creepy. Nevertheless, you can see that the model is trying to fit a you know, sort of natural looking face to what it sees in the image. Okay? This is applied to videos. It's, fairly, it's done in a frame by frame uh, way, which is uh, independent of the frame you're fitting. It looks stable just because the reconstruction is pretty robust. Okay? There is no temporal smooth that's going on here. And finally, because this is unsupervised, you can change the subject. Instead of looking at humans, you can, look at, you can look at cats, and it still works, and you can get pretty good reconstructions too. And we can do that because we don't have any labels, so you know, just need to collect some data set of, a data set of faces of cats and just apply the network and, and sort of works. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip over these two slides in the interest of time. So what's next? So that's all I wanted to say about our research. If there's more if you're interested, you can look at that in my, on our website, I suppose. Um, so I think it's fair to say that supervised learning is going to be a very big topic in the next couple of years. And I think the attention is going to move from just learning features to learning structure, something which is interpretable, like labels, three shapes, um, you know, segmentation of an image, etc. There are a bunch of questions which are very important. One is to use is which cues should we use to learn the unsupervised manner. For example, I showed you that 
pretty detailed photometric reasoning can lead you to surprisingly good 3D reconstruction in a supervised environment, although you use noisy internet images to, to do the training, which is something I did not expect, because you see, usually photometric cues are rather fragile, but it seems they seem to work well. And which representation is also important, I showed you a new, a new 3D representation today, which is this C3DM uh, method. But uh, in fact, the question of which representation to use is still open. You can use meshes in this function that maps the following with models. We don't really know what's the best representation to really have here. It has to be able to represent geometry, but also it has to be able to go well with our supervised learning. And getting these two things to work well together is actually quite challenging. And final slide, just some thank you. Uh, so I have, of course, uh, a very uh, large team that is working with me. And so these are all, all a subset of it, of the, a subset of the people that are involved in the papers I presented today, but there are more. And of course, this is work done in Oxford as well as Facebook and beyond. All right, thank you. And if there are questions, now is the time. All right, thank you, Andrea. Um, <clears throat> so we had a couple of questions uh, due to the breakup in, in the middle. I, I think we are a little bit of over time, but let me ask one question uh, from the audience. Uh, Isma Haji asked, I guess, uh, regarding your 3D human body pose reconstruction, um, yes. did you try to visualize intermediate feature maps to see what is responsible for encoding a pose? And if not, how would you go about uh, doing that? So, so it's a question about the results. 3D reconstruction. Um, I mean, the 3D reconstruction is, uh, so um, I'm just gonna quickly move back to that, uh, to that slide. But so, the, uh, so this 3D reconstruction, they are determined based on a network, which is like CMR or spin. And so they, uh, you go, whoops. I guess this, right? So, um, it's really hard to say. So the network is standard. There is nothing special about that. And the parameters are just this filter weight. So we don't really know how the processing works in this case. I suppose you could, I mean, we also done a lot of work on visualizing deep networks. So we could try to do some visualizations to see, for example, uh, which part of the input image are responsible for which parameter to the model. And this is definitely possible, but we didn't do that. Other than that, the network itself doesn't have a particular structure beyond what you can really find in the CMR or spin. Okay, um, so we had some other questions, but uh, again, uh, it's the limited time. I guess we will have to move on. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for a very inspiring talk. And I guess all of us can give you a virtual uh, round of applause. Thank you. And sorry for being over time. I lost a bit of a bit notion of time with the, because of the breakup. Bye-bye. No right. Bye-bye.